Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Merging Revolutionary Wars, Rev War Revelry. Uh, it is Mother's Day, um, and as such, uh, we decided uh, what better uh, person to focus on and sites to focus on than those related to uh, the mother of George Washington, Mary Ball Washington. So uh, we have uh, with us tonight two special guests uh, who work with the Washington Heritage Museums uh, here in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, I'm uh, proud to have uh, recently moved uh, just outside of uh, Fredericksburg. So I'm here in Stafford County, Virginia, coming down from Alexandria. And uh, I have to say that the only town uh, that I think uh, has a closer association with uh, the founding father, George Washington, other than Alexandria, has to be Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, and our, our two guests are uh, Ann Darren and Michelle Hamilton. Uh, so thank you uh, for taking some time to talk to us about uh, Mary Washington and, and the sites associated with her in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and, and get started uh, and, and talk a little bit about Mary Washington. Uh, now, Michelle is the, actually an author of a, a book about Mary Washington. And uh, so, so, yeah, what can you uh, give us a little background on uh, uh, who Mary Washington was uh, in her uh, connection to George Washington? Well, Mary Ball Washington was the mother of George Washington. She was born in 1708 and uh, here in Virginia and Westmoreland County. And she was, uh, excuse me, Lancaster County. That was a big mistake. She was born in Lancaster County in 1708. And she uh, was an orphan very young when she, her father dies when she is three. And her mother and stepfather die by by time she's 12. Um, so she's orphaned very young, has a profound um, influence on, on Mary. She marries Augustine in 1735, and she will, excuse me, oh my, I am mess, I'm so messing up on my dates here. Uh, <laughs> hopefully we can cut this out here. Oh, God, let me restart. That's fine. Um, this is not a day. Okay, so she, Mary Ball Washington was born in 1708 in Lancaster County, Virginia, she, her father uh, dies when she is three, so she um, was uh, experienced that loss very young, and then her mother and stepfather pass away by the time she is 12. Fortunately, she does have an elder half-sister named Elizabeth who cares for Mary, so she does uh, grow up in a family circle, but again, it is marked by loss very young. She marries Augustine in 1731. She gives birth to her oldest son, uh, George, in 1732, and she will have five more children, Betty, Samuel, John Augustine, Charles, and Mildred. And when she is just 35, her husband, Augustine, passes away. So she is a single mother. Um, the one child she loses is, is Mildred, um, dies in infancy, but she is a single mother to five children. So that, again, will... Um, profoundly influenced her life and also the life of her children. She's a very strong influence in George's life. A lot of his personality comes from Mary, his love of gardening, his love of horses, um, his deep moral background is instilled in him at a very young age from Mary and also from Augustine, but also from Mary. Um, she read a lot of religious books and texts that are around in the house. So this is, has a deep influence on George's moral outlook. And in 1772, she moves to the Mary Washington house here in Fredericksburg, and she will live in the house for the final 17 years of her life before she passes away in 1789 at the age of 80 from breast cancer. Yeah, now it sounds like, I mean, she had a, that's a, I mean, you talk about a tough woman, um, uh, a lot of adversity uh, she seemed to have in her life, uh, you know, being orphaned uh, so young and then um, and, and then also those, uh, 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 you know, losing her husband and being a, a single mother at the end at that, that time that was that was fairly rare. Is that correct? Uh, normally, I feel like when somebody's widowed, they would they would remarry uh, fairly quickly. Correct. It was very common for women to remarry after being widowed. Her own mother had been married three times. 
um, her, her, her husband's passes away, and then she will remarry fairly shortly after. In Mary's case, we can speculate why she chose not to remarry, and mainly it was economics. Her husband husband uh, she has minor children and her husband was concerned and he writes in his will because when a woman remarries her new husband will have control of the estate of the minor children he can do with it whatever he wishes including um you know if, they, if he's not smart business-wise the children who lose their inheritance and that had happened to augustine as a child his uh, stepfather that did not was not very good business and there was a loss of property and money so augustine's uh, senior were right in his will that his two oldest sons from his first marriage uh that we uh lawrence and augustine jr uh washington were to come in and if they're dissatisfied in any way with how their younger siblings inheritances were being maintained they could sue for custody so mary could have lost for her four boys custody of her four sons and she was not about uh, to let that happen so economically it was not in her advantage to remarry uh, because again divorce in this time period was was very very rare um, and um, he, he could do whatever he wishes with her children's inheritances yeah so so it was, it was you know important for Washington's development that uh that, that she maintained her status. And uh, even though it would have made yeah, her life much more difficult, um, which is uh, uh, a lot to sacrifice for her, uh, for not just George, but all her children, which is pretty amazing. Um, and so- And there uh, is family, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. And there is family, there, there is family rumor that she did do marriage proposals. So it was not that she was an undesirable um, catch. Really? Wow. Uh, yeah, I hadn't heard that before. That's pretty interesting. So, um, yeah, no, th th that's and now I, I feel like uh, from a lot of people's uh, knowledge of, of of Mary Washington, they might know her from an anecdote uh, early in Washington's life uh, that he wanted to go into the Navy um, and that uh, uh, Mary is the one that dissuades him from from doing so, uh, any any truth to that story? And because uh, uh, obviously if Washington had joined the British Navy that would have altered the course of uh, world history. Uh, but yeah, your thoughts on that story. Uh, that is true, that is documented. Um, the reason she, just, at first she is in favor of him joining and being a midshipman in the British Navy until she writes to her older half brother who was a merchant in London. And she writes him a letter proposed in detailing, uh, we don't, uh, what was gonna happen. And we have the surviving letter where he writes back and very strongly urges against allowing George to uh, join the Navy. He says that he will not be able to advance um, up the ranks because the family is not wealthy enough to purchase. He is also colonial born, so uh, instantly that it has it against him in the British in that pecking order of the British Navy, and also going in there as a young um, midshipman around the age of twelve, he will be abused um, physically um, in the British Navy, and uh, that uh, they uh, treat dogs better than than um, the young under underlings, and so he says it would be better for young George to be a tinker, meaning somebody that that repairs broken. Um, tinware than it is to join the British Navy. Yeah. Huh. Wow. Yeah, no, and I, I know that had a, a strong influence on, you know, uh, Washington later, you know, he has dreams of military glory. Um, and uh, uh, it's just interesting that, um, uh, you know, that decision point uh, obviously had a, a major impact in Washington's life. And then even when he does get into the military, he still feels that kind of anti-provincial bias within the British military is going to help take him down the path to, to a revolutionary. Um, but so, so yeah, so, and then in 1772, uh, uh, she, she's going to move from Ferry Farm across the river into the town of Fredericksburg. Uh, maybe, Anne, if you want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, the, the house itself, uh, um, you know, Mary Washington is going to live there for the last few years of her life. And, uh, and, and today it, it still exists, right? And uh, is, is part of your museum uh, group? 
Yeah. So um, first, thank you so much for having us today. We really appreciate it. Um, and what a wonderful way to celebrate Mother's Day with um, a tribute to Mary. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, in 1772, um, Mary moved across the river. George had selected a, a home for her that was near Betty Lewis, um, her daughter. And if you were to visit the Mary Washington house today, you might think that she lived in a quite large home. Um, and I would say that's somewhat misleading if you look at it from the street. She would have lived at, if you're looking at the building, the leftmost or southernmost portion of the building. Um, and her kitchen likely would have been the northmost or furthest to the right. Um, over time, things filled in in between um, to make it the large home that it is now. But it would have been a comfortable home for her at that time. Um, she was not, you know, it was not like Fairy Farm. Um, and she did not have, um, you know, a bunch of children living with her. So it, it would have suited her needs. Um, you know, we talked about Mary Washington's story and the adversity she faced. That's what makes her story so relatable is that it's single motherhood. It's the what do you do with aging parents, um, breast cancer. There's any one of a number of things that just make her story so relatable to others. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think Mary Washington, it's interesting because uh, uh, I, I feel like the way she's been remembered over the years has gone up and down. Uh, so <laughs> I feel like uh, she was revered uh, for a long time simply as the the, the mother of Washington. Uh, but a, a lot of histories I've read also could be uh, uh, quite hard on her. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that she could be overbearing uh, and domineering and uh, 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 complaining a lot to, to George. And I, their relationship uh, between George and his mother, I think, has been the subject of a lot of uh, controversy and debate. Um, uh, what do you all think of, of this relationship between George and his mom? Is it, is it as bad as some historians seem to claim, uh, uh, or, or, or I'm just curious as to what, what you all, how you all interpret Washington and his relationship with his mother? I'll let Michelle speak to the documented part, but the one thing I would say is, um, and I, I say this as a parent and probably speaking for most parents, imagine if the only record of your relationship with your children was letters. And so that some of those private conversations that you had were through letters. And I'm pretty sure that I could speak with relative certainty and say that any of us, if we were judged by some conversations with our children, could be judged in the way Mary's been judged. Um, you know, not everything in parenthood is smooth sailing as, as any parent knows, especially when they enter their teen years and, and older, um, and even adult relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Michelle, do you have any, uh, uh, thoughts on this, uh, on their relationship and, or what historically is documented, uh, between what we know about the two of them? It is difficult. Um, because there was only, sorry, I'm going to shut my cell phone off. Um, there was only six surviving uh, letters um, between um, George and his mother. Um, so that alone is uh, difficult to um, document. Um, and one of those letters is actually badly burned. So, um, and not all of them were to George Washington. Again, it is difficult to document what happened privately versus what's been going on in, in the letters. There is huge gaps in, in the historic record. Um, George um, did not write home very much during the American Revolution, again, for fear that his, his, his um, uh, letters would be, would be um, uh, seized by, the, by British or be posted in, in the newspapers like John Adams' uh, letters were. 
Uh, so um, again, what happens between closed doors and what we what we have in, in print is completely different. Yeah, no, that's true. And yeah, like, and what you were saying, you know, it's, you know, yeah, hard to judge things on uh, such limited uh, documentation that we have. Um, but we do know that, you know, uh, at, what I find amazing is, you know, she, and for that time period, and in that family, she lived a very long life. Uh, I think it's interesting that, you know, throughout all of the the story of Washington during the revolution uh, and the constitutional convention that his mother is still alive and living there in Fredericksburg throughout all of this kind of drama of the time period. Um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, and I, that the, the, y'all used to do the, uh, the, the reenactment of uh, Washington saying farewell to his mother, um, uh, which, which I had attended a few times. And that's got to be one of the more, significant moments in the, the, the history of that house, because that's going to be uh, the last time that Washington actually meets with uh, his mother. What do we know about, about that particular event um, uh, and what happened there in 1789? Michelle, do you want to take that one? And um, I, I can say, I because I too had been to some of those reenactments, um, and they were very poignant, that's for certain. Um, unfortunately, we, we often tied them with Mother's Day and it's such a sad thing to put on what should be a happy day. Um, so we've, we've considered doing them again, but at a different time of the year. The meeting occurred in April of 1789. Um, by this point, George is beginning to wrap up his personal affairs, knowing that he is going to be called to become the first president of the United States and, and what is New York City, the, which, which was then the, uh, the capital for the United States. So he comes in April and the story we have comes from one of Mary's grandchildren uh, that uh, there was a very tender meeting between George and Mary. Um, Mary it was at this point very frail, but she wanted to be um, removed from bed, get up from bed so that George would not see her bedroom. And they had a very tender uh, goodbye. Uh, George asked for her blessing before, before he leaves. And that is something usually a man would ask his father in this time period, but because he is, um, his father has been deceased for many, many years by this point, he will ask his mother. She will give it to him. She tells him to go wherever God sends you, um, but always know that he will have his mother's blessing. And also George will give her some money uh, to help pay for some of her very expensive uh, medical treatment. At first, Mary uh, declines, does not want to accept the money. And George tells her that this is basically the last thing I can do for you financially. Please accept my gift to you. And so he, she does take the gift um, of the money. And according to the, the grandchild that was from um, Betty Lewis's um, son who records this, um, Betty comes down to check on her mother and finds that she's kind of sitting there kind of staring off the space for a moment kind of after, after this meeting between, between um, mother and son. So this is, this is what, um, what we have from the historic record. And then at this point, some things we just have to trust the family record. Yeah, no, that's a, uh, you know, yeah, it, yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, it, it, it's very sad. I mean, I think that's interesting that you, uh, you mentioned the, the, the money for medical uh, treatments. Um, was this uh, from the, you mentioned that she had passed away from breast cancer. Was that what she was looking for treatment for? Yes, when she dies, um, Betty is, her daughter try, is trying to sell the estate and she even writes to George. Uh, that they are having an outstanding balance about 40 pounds in their money to their her two physicians that the price of the treatment was more than they expected and um, near the end of her life um, George is even writing to Dr. Benjamin Rush um, asking for medical advice on on the treatment for breast cancer and there was very limited um, hemlock arsenic uh, mercury uh, was being used and they're trying to find hemlock which did not grow naturally here in in Virginia or at least in this area so they're trying to find hemlock to create a paste to put on the on the um, wound um, on the on the tumor oh geez wow yeah no that's uh even you know I mean talking about how, what a relatable story you know we typically think of yeah Washington 
going off to be president of the United States and you don't realize that, you know, the very real family issues that he's dealing with, uh, uh, which is, uh, um, yeah, just, just really interesting to know uh, what his mother's going through while he's, uh, you know, dealing with the, the, you know, creation of the, the new country. So um, do we know uh, uh, what, uh, was Mary proud of her son for, I mean, he's probably the most famous uh, American in the world. Other than maybe, uh, maybe Ben Franklin could uh, uh, compete with him, but he's got to be one of the most famous people in the whole world at that time. Uh, do we have any uh, knowledge of what she thought of this? If uh, I mean, this has to be uh, uh, pretty amazing uh, to, to see him, you know, from childhood uh, in, into that position. She was very modest um, and had taught, taught the Washingtons to try to be as modest as possible. And so we have from people that know Mary, they say that she didn't brag. She didn't talk about him. Doesn't mean internally she's not proud, but again, she's from that time period and that where you don't, you don't exhibit it. Pride, pride again, um, being a very, very religious person and she would have seen pride as sinful. So trying to keep, um, you know, you pride within yourself, try to be very moral and upstanding. I always think it's interesting that basically the Ball family motto translates to behold the heavens and the Washington family motto translates in some translations, the, the ends justify. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. And I think you do see a lot of, uh, you know, those, those kind of uh, attributes Washington displays, uh, especially later in life, for sure. Um, so you mentioned she's very religious. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about these, these uh, monuments we have behind us over here. So uh, uh, your group, the Washington Heritage Museums, uh, uh, has recently acquired a new uh, uh, space here in, in Fredericksburg. Do you want to Maybe, Anne, you want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, that for us? Sure. So we were in negotiations with the city of Fredericksburg for, for quite some time, many months, um, as they sought a new steward for the Mary Washington. Initially, um, the caretaker's lodge was specifically what they were trying to figure out what to do with. Um, but we worked with them and the city on January 19th transferred to Washington Heritage Museums, the property that includes the Mary Washington Monument, the Caretaker's Lodge, uh, the Gordon Cemetery, Meditation Rock, where Mary Washington would have walked to um, seek solace and prayer and also the Eskridge Oak, um, the Eskridge Oak being planted in 1937 in memory of George Eskridge, her uh, guardian. So it's altogether, I believe it's 1.36 acres. Um, we're so excited at the wonderful opportunity this brings. Um, as I mentioned, the city had struggled with what to do with the property to properly care for it. It had since 2011 been sporadically inhabited um, as a rental unit. And the property as a whole had been, had become very overgrown. Um, and I'm not saying anything the city wouldn't say, <laughs> um, but you could drive right past it and not know it was there. Um, there was ivy covering the entire um, brick perimeter wall um, that we've removed since then. And there's still um, one of the things we'll be doing is removing some of the overgrowth that that hides, shelters the um, caretaker's lodge. So we just had our first school tour there. I believe it's two weeks ago tomorrow. Um, so we're really excited because first school tour, that's kind of a neat thing. Um, but we're looking forward to raising the educational potential of the site. 
we're looking forward to hopefully finding out exactly where on the site Mary Washington is buried. Nobody knows, unless you do, Mark. I don't know, but <laughs> um, no, that's I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I was gonna ask that because because uh, yeah, it's it's her her grave site in addition to the, the monument, and uh, and yeah, it's interesting because there's that that family cemetery there, um, right. and I for. Yeah, what, when she was buried there or any of the details of her burial, um, uh, you know, because, you know, with any, any information, I guess you guys, it sounds like you're still trying to figure out the exact spot, but. Um, exactly. Yeah, no, that's, that's really fascinating, so. Yeah, I think the one thing we can say with certainty is we don't believe that she's buried like right under the monument. Um, but other than that, we're not entirely sure. Um, and certainly we want to, to locate that. Um, and then as far as other plans, we want to make the site ADA accessible. Right now, if you um, were somebody with mobility concerns and you came to visit the site, the first thing you'd be greeted with is a big set of steps. And that is a, a real challenge for many people. However, if you go closer to where the caretaker's lodge is, um, then you can exit a vehicle and travel across the property at grade so that you're not having to go up an incline. Um, and then even for those who don't have mobility concerns, um, even still trying to get around in the site currently can be difficult trying to get down to Meditation Rock um, or the Escrit Joke. There's some erosion concerns and there's some old steps that are um, not currently in the best, uh, best condition for somebody to get up and down. So there's a, those things. And then we also um, seek to add an education center in the building. Um, kind of a small self-guided museum. So we're excited at the potential this brings and really looking forward to all of it. Yeah, no, that's uh, really exciting. And, and, you know, I can't think of yeah better stewards than uh, folks who are also interpreting, you know, her last... Uh, her last residence there in the city too. So it really kind of, I feel ties together um, uh, both your site and uh, and her final resting place. And the monument itself too is, uh, you know, I was just up there the other day and, uh, you know, noticed, uh, I think a plaque was put up there not too long ago um, that this is the first monument to a woman by women, um, which I thought was uh, uh, pretty interesting. So the, the whole story of the monument's creation is interesting in and of itself. Like, even if it weren't to Mary Washington, if it were to somebody else, just the story of its creation is interesting. Um, in Congress had authorized a monument to be built years before. And in 1833, they laid the cornerstone of the monument. It got partially built, but never completed. Mm -hmm. um, and then relic hunters and the Civil War and so many things just made it so that that monument could not be completed. And so it wasn't until years later that they... Um, the current monument was dedicated in 1894. I mean, that's that's quite a quite a difference of years. Um, there were two women's groups who banded together initially um, to raise the funds to build the monument, and then they couldn't get along. So then they gave it to the city. I mean, it's it's just altogether an interesting story. Um, of how it was created and and the fact that it is the first monument which um, you know due to social changes at that time women 
for so many reasons, whether it's because of machinery, economics, what have you, they, they had more time on their hands, but most women didn't work outside the home at that time. So they were able to turn their attention to civic things, such as raising the funds for the monument. Yeah, no, that's, uh, you know, that, that's so important for these yeah early heritage groups uh, and, and the role women played in uh in, in kind of fostering, as you said, the, the, the civic duty to uh, remember this uh, earlier time period and, and those, those values and things like that they wanted to pass down to, to future generations. Um, and yeah, and I think, uh, did you all uh, uh, have like, um, you know, I think it was uh, lit up in pink uh, uh, as well, so. We did, so for the first couple of weeks, we lit it up in pink just to, signified that there had been a change, that it was, um, you know, that the city had gifted it to us. And we're so grateful. The city truly was um, wonderful to work with at every step of the way. Um, every staff member we worked with was fantastic to work with. Um, so helpful, often, you know, it was sort of new territory for us. And at every step, they were there to help us and, and help us navigate what was needed next. Yeah, no, it's, um, and anybody who hasn't been there, it's, it's a great, I mean, it's a very dramatic, you can't see it in these pictures, but uh, it's very dramatic landscape there. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it being at the, the meditation rock there is, is, is pretty amazing. And then, yeah, when you think of the, the layers of history, um, you know, uh, like I said, I, I think looking at, you know, period drawings and things like that from the you know, Civil War era, you can see the old uh, incomplete monument there. And, uh, um, and, and all of this was, was within the, the battlefield of the, the 1862 Battle of Fredericksburg. Um, so it, it's, it's remarkable, you know, that, that these... Uh, resources have survived uh, uh, and that you can actually uh, still see them having survived through the war. Um, are there any any stories, uh, any interesting stories from the that Civil War era, the fact that they, re did anybody realize that they were, you know, this was the home of Mary Washington and that the, 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 the significance of, uh, you know, this national fratricidal war happening right where Washington's mother once lived? Uh, yes, I did. In fact, uh, next in June, we're going to be doing a tour on um, Mary Washington's house during the Civil War. Um, the house did receive damage. It was hit at least twice by cannon up in the upper rafters. And um, the house was used as a hospital for both sides, um, the, for the Confederates during the Battle of Fredericksburg, and then following uh, in 1864, following Spots Spotsylvania Courthouse, a number of soldiers came in to um, recuperate uh, in the Mayor Washington House, and one of the gentlemen, he was a member of the Iron Brigade, uh, Corporal Root, and he was able, he wrote, later wrote his memoir, and he writes about knowing that it was the Mary Washington House, that the housekeeper told him it was Mary Washington's house, and he then told his other companions that um, they were going to get better because uh, they were, no one was going to die in the Mary Washington house because, you know, George, George and Mary weren't going to let that happen. This was the best place for them. They had the best um, uh, house in town to recuperate in. Wow. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's amazing to think, uh, to, to realize that they were taking part in making history at, at the site where, you know, all the significant history had happened in the past. So, um, now, now, Washington Heritage Museums also, you know, so you have Mary Washington's house. Now you also have the, uh, the, the grave site up there. Is there, um, but th these are only a couple of the sites that you all take care of. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of these other historic sites? Sure. sure. So um, the other sites that we have would be the Humor Sir Apothecary Shop, which portrays the medical practice of Dr. Hugh Mercer. Um, Mercer, to say that he was Mary Washington's physician wouldn't exactly be correct, but he did treat her much like if you went to your own doctor or tried to, and they were not in town, you would go, you know, if you needed care, you'd go see somebody else. So he did treat her, but was not her personal physician. 
Um, the Rising Sun Tavern was originally the home of her youngest son, Charles. Um, and then when he and his wife moved out to form Charlestown, West Virginia, now West Virginia, um, it became a tavern. And so from about the early 1790s to uh, just prior to 1830, that was a, a tavern. Um, so it's a it's a neat stop because if you don't know a whole lot about what tavern life would have been like, that's how we interpret it mostly is as a tavern. Um, our offices are at St. James House, which was originally the home of James Mercer, witnessed the will of Mary Washington, um, and was a member of the House of Burgesses, an attorney, and so we will, um, I should mention that when we are done with um, some renovations at the lodge, we will move our uh, headquarters there. It's much more suitable for being able to have a multi-purpose space for events or classes, um, educational reasons. And as I mentioned, we'll have the small uh, muse self-guided museum up there and we'll move our offices there as well okay excellent yeah no you, you it's a lot of uh a lot of properties you're you're caring for but y'all do a, a fantastic job of uh and, and what what really fascinating uh people to uh to interpret as well i know hugh mercer is one of my uh one of my favorite heroes of the revolution so i'm glad to you know, that, but then also, you know, just medical practices in the 18th century, which can be a, a scary thing, uh, is, uh, is, is always fascinating uh, uh, to learn about. Um, and uh, yeah, well, do you also, this summer, uh, you know, you mentioned the a Civil War tour. Uh, uh, do you have any other uh, uh, kind of uh, programs or uh, special events coming up uh, that you'd like to uh, let people know about uh, they might be interested in in and possibly coming to, to join you for some of these events absolutely so we have a couple some of our summer events have really become iconic within fredericksburg on july 4th at the apothecary shop we do a live reading of the declaration of independence and if if there's anybody listening who has not come to hear it read aloud, either you know at our site or or anywhere. We invite you to come listen to it. It is just so. Um, it's different when it's read aloud than when you're reading it on paper. It's entirely different, uh, and we have people of all ages gather to hear it, which is wonderful. I'm always amazed at how many people record it, um, which I just think is absolutely wonderful. Um, so that's exciting. And as you know, um, on Memorial Day, you will be our guest speaker at the wreath laying at the Mercer Monument, another signature summer event. Um, hopefully it won't be quite as hot this year um as it has been some other years but um, it's a wonderful way to honor the commitment of Hugh Mercer as well as others who have given their life for the country um, we will be for the second year in a row hosting twilight history for children that are eight to 12 years old um, there's two times, um, one in June and then one in late July, beginning of August. And those are up on our website. And anybody who is interested in those or, or any of our events is welcome to visit our website and take a look at our programming, which really goes year round. There's there's seldom a month that we don't have something going on, whether it's that or our speaker series, which um, will resume in the fall. And there's there's always it seems that there's always something to be to be working on and planned, um, whether it's those or our signature fundraiser, Bourbon and Boxwood. Um, 
just it as I say, it seems that there's something going on all the time. Yeah, now you, you all do a great job of uh, programs and events, and yeah, I'm honored to be able to be a part of the the this speech uh, at a uh, Hugh Mercer statue because uh, it, it you know and that also ties into this whole landscape of you know walking from Mary Washington House up to up to her gravesite. You know, you you pass Kenmore where uh, uh, Betty uh, Lewis lived, and then. You have the Hugh Mercer statue, and then you have the uh, the grave site there. It's just a great uh, historic place. If anybody's listening or uh, has never been uh, to this uh, to these places, it's just uh, uh, so much history, and like I said, all these layers. And so uh, I'm glad you guys do so much to to interpret this history to let people, both locals and and, and people from all across the country, be able to come and, and learn about who these people were, what they did, and why it mattered. Uh, it's just uh, uh, pretty amazing, and and your your lecture series you all do is is fantastic as well. I, I was able to speak at that I think right after my uh, victory or death book came out a, a few years ago, and that was uh, uh, you have a great community of people who are really interested in in, in learning more about all these different topics. So uh, yeah, you all uh, keep up the uh, the good work with that. Um, so uh, I just uh, pivoting a little bit back to uh, 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 to Mary Washington, uh, Michelle. Now you have a a book on Mary Washington. If people were interested in in being able to to get a copy of that, how could they how could they do that? Okay, my book is Mary Ball Washington, the mother of George Washington. It's available here at the Mary Washington House Museum store, and also it is on Amazon. So those are the two. I always recommend coming down, uh, getting it here at our wonderful museum store. We do have a variety of books on the history of Washington and the time period, plus lots of other lovely items. But if a travel is an issue, there's always, it's always available on Amazon. And uh, if you know, obviously your book's probably the best one on there, but if people, if you have recommendations for, for people who, who want to really delve deep into the story of Mary, do you recommend any other uh, uh, books uh, that people could uh, check out to, to learn more about who she was and, and why she is important? The best is The Widow Washington by Martha Saxton, came out a couple of years ago, and that also does a wonderful job of placing Mary within her time period as an 18th century woman. Okay, excellent. Yeah, now, and like I said, uh, you know, her, you know, and it's great because, you know, nothing's going to beat then uh, being in the actual spot where she lives. So, uh, and if people want to come uh, uh, visit the, the Mary Washington house, uh, what, what's your typical uh, hours? Are you all open every day of the week or is it certain days? Um, just so people know. Starting May 15th, we will be open seven days a week, um, uh, Monday through Saturday, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., and Sunday, uh, 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Excellent. Yeah, that's really cool. So, uh, like I said, and I've been down there. It's a great, great resource, uh, lots of good history, so so be sure to check that out. Uh, any, uh, any final thoughts on anything you all would like to talk about? Yeah, so I would say that if they are coming down, I highly recommend that they go on our website and purchase a heritage pass or uh, purchase that when they're here. And that way they can also visit the Rising Sun Tavern and the Hugh Mercer Apothecary Shop. It's a, a great way to, to get a little bit of a discount for seeing all our sites. Um, the other thing I would say is, you know, preservation is never quick. And it's never cheap, unfortunately. Um, so this is where I'll put in the plug to say we would love to have um, the viewers of this join Washington Heritage Museums and or um, make a donation towards the monument projects. Um, WashingtonHeritageMuseums.org and then slash uh, membership support or if they just go on our webpage, WashingtonHeritageMuseums.org and click on membership support. Um, there's information there on how they can join our museum group and be able to visit year round for free and learn, about, learn all about our events, get early access to our events, um, get discounts. It's, it's a great um, way to support the museums while also getting some fun benefits. 
but then there's also ways that they can help support the work that we're doing at the Mary Washington Monument. Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely echo that, uh, you know, supporting, uh, you know, museum groups such as yourselves is, is so important. And you all have, yeah, you know, like I said, such a great uh, grouping of, of historic sites and, and expanding. And uh, yeah, we want to uh, definitely encourage all our viewers to to, to help support um, the, the Washington Heritage uh, Museum. So uh, we really appreciate all that you guys do uh, to, to promote this history and, uh, and, pr and preserve and interpret the sites where it actually happened, so. I appreciate that. Where can you have one membership that supports so many different museums? I mean, that's, that's somewhat unheard of. Yes, and 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 also for 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 people that were were so significant uh, in, in our nation's history, the mother of Washington, Hugh Mercer, who who gave his life for the country. Uh, uh, it, it's just uh, yeah, so significant, and uh, and and the fact that we have tangible uh, reminders of that uh, long time period ago is uh, it, it's so important what you all do. Um, so yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, and uh, we'll be back uh, in two weeks uh, for our next installment of uh, Revel War Revelry. We'll be uh, checking out uh, the Battle of Waxhaws, uh, and this will be on uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you.